The Greeks are something that we've met before in previous levels. The Greeks are all about sensitivities. The sensitivity of an option's, um, usually an option's value, but it could be some other feature of an option. It's the sensitivity of an option with respect to some key input to the pricing of the option. So we have, like I say, we have met these before at previous levels. Um, the, uh, the key thing with the Greeks to keep in mind when you're looking at them is that all they are is, as I say, a measure of sensitivity. How much something to do with the option changes, usually premium, relative to some key variable which drives that value. So the first Greek that we'll look at is the delta of an option. The delta of an option is the change in the option's premium or price for a dollar change in the underlying. So if you like, this is the sensitivity of the option's value relative to the value of the underlying, um, the spot asset. Um, they call it stock here, but we mean spot underlying asset. Now, in previous modules, we spent a lot of time dealing with the basic payoffs of the four different option positions. And you know what I'm going to draw here. All right, there's my options diamond once more. Okay, this is, uh, you know, uh, ad nauseum with this particular picture, but that's because it is very, very useful indeed when we're thinking about how options behave. Remember, you've got your long positions on the top, you've got your shorts on the bottom, you've got calls on the left, and you've got puts on the right. And you can have this kind of um, shape in your mind, this pattern in your mind, and it gives you the payoff for a long call option, top left there, um, a long put option, top right. Don't forget the implication, as I always say, is that the underlying is going up and down as we move horizontally, and that this general, um, this axis here is generally P and L. All right, however, if you ignore, if you ignore the premium that's been paid for any of these options, you can always view it as just the end value of the option. Okay, for example, a long call is worthless when it's out the money, and the underlying is below the strike. Strike is where these lines change direction, okay? Um, it's in the money when you're getting to buy at X something that's worth more than X. That's just putting a little bit of color on these diagrams, which, you know, has always been the implication. With puts, of course, with long puts, they go into the money when um, the underlying falls below the strike and they're out of the money and worthless, zero value if you like, when the underlying is above that price, that strike price that you can choose to sell the underlying at. So, and once again, I'll just reinforce what I've said in earlier modules, and that is the short side can just be viewed as a negative kind of reflection of the long side. And uh, if you do that, that's the most efficient way, I think, of dealing with the short side of options. Now, what we're going to do when we think about delta is we're going to acknowledge that these payoff diagrams are at expiry. That's something that's always been a default assumption. These payoff diagrams, or the way I'm going to view them now, value diagrams, they're always at expiry. That, in other words, there's no time left for, um, to go for these options. And I'm just going to um, focus on the long side, because I think that's probably the most useful thing to do and give myself a little bit more room here. There's a long call, top left of the options diamond. And what we've said is that this is the value of the call at expiry. Prior to expiry, what you'd expect to see is the option to have a little bit of time value, all right? That hockey stick is actually the intrinsic value of the option. It's how much you get from the exercise decision. Prior to expiry, you'd expect the option to have a little bit of time value and trade above that blue hockey stick. So this is what a long call <coughs> would look like prior to expiry. Prior to expiry. It'll trade along that red curve. Now, the reason that I'm, uh, the reason that I'm uh, uh, diving into this is because you can see delta from this red curve. Um, and it might, it's always useful to see things, isn't it? Don't forget, S is the horizontal axis here. The underlying asset is the horizontal axis. And in this particular case, I'm viewing this horizontal, excuse me, this vertical axis as the value of the option, take the premium off and that's the net P&L. Take the premium off that you paid and that's the net P&L. Now, um, 
Delta, where can we see delta here? Well, delta is actually the slope. It's one way of, um, if you like, seeing delta. It's the slope of the tangent to this line because it's how sensitive the red option is prior to expiry versus the underlying, versus the horizontal axis. So you can view delta as the slope of that line. That's one way of viewing it, one way of seeing it. You can see that for a long call, delta approaches one here, uh, a one-for-one one relationship with the underlying. As the underlying goes up by one, the call option goes up by approximately one. So when we're deeply in the money, that's what we are with a call over here, we're deeply in the money, the delta approaches one. And when we're deeply out the money, over here, when we wouldn't exercise the option, you can see that the slope approaches zero, delta approaches zero. And in the middle you might say, well is delta about a half then? Well, we can go better than that. Delta is a half when we are at pure, right, directly at the money, delta is a half. You've got half the exposure to the underlying um, when you're at the money in the middle of that diagram. That's another way of thinking of delta. Delta is the exposure that you're getting through the option. Okay, so high exposure here when the option's behaving like the underlying, low exposure when we're out the money and the delta is close to zero. So, um, yeah, this is, um, it's always worthwhile seeing things. This is how I picture delta in my mind. For long calls, as we've seen, it's between zero and plus one. Uh, for long puts, it doesn't take us too much extrapolation of the analysis that we've just been doing to just put the put right next to this diagram. And when we do that, we can kind of sketch the same idea. Everything is analogous. Um, you know, the put will trade on a curve prior to expiry like this. Everything is analogous, but not exactly the same. We're obviously in the money on the put when the underlying is low relative to the strike. We're out the money when the underlying is high relative to the strike. But you can use this idea of thinking about the slope for the delta again. So this slope here is negative one. It's close to negative one. Okay, as the underlying goes up, uh, the option, the red put, is falling by about one. Yeah, well, it's falling by about the same amount. So delta is um, minus one there because it's a negative relationship. <coughs> delta is approaching zero here, but from be below. All right, in other words, delta is negative, still negative there, but approaching zero. And delta is about minus a half when we're in the middle and we're at the money. So there's the delta for your puts, just to complete this setup. These are your calls here, and these are your puts. Okay, And that's the long side. If you want to think about the short side, take my advice, just flick the signs, the polarity of the signs from positive to negative, or vice versa, and you'll get the delta of a, of a short position. But focus on the long side, because I think that's the most intuitively accessible um, side of things. So yes, negative for long puts, minus one to zero. Okay, the more in the money an option, the higher the absolute value of delta is. Yep, we can see that. The more in the money the option is, the closer the delta is to one in absolute terms if we ignore signs and just think about size. The more out the money, closer we are to zero. That's kind of like a tautological statement um, related to the second statement that we've made. The delta of a long position in one unit of the underlying is plus one. In other words, the sensitivity of the underlying to itself is just one, and the sensitivity of a short position is minus one. So you might sort of wonder, why are we bothering with the deltas of positions themselves? Well, the answer is <coughs> we might be combining um, positions in the underlying with options. You know, think of protective puts and covered calls and things like that. Um, we might be combining them, and in that case, we might be looking at a net delta um, or a an overall position delta, as we'll see later on. So we should be comfortable with what delta is. Um, here, look, we've got an example of a May 55 call. That's the strike. Exercise price, um, 55 call with a delta of 0.47. Um, and you can interpret that as your exposure. If the stock price S, the underlying S, rises by a dollar, the call should should rise by approximately 0.47. Now, we say should in inverted commas because we are assuming that everything stays constant, including the sensitivity of the option to a movement in the underlying. You know, you'll notice that the delta is based on this straight line. 
the tangent to this curved slope, um, this curved red slope. Um, I should say this curved red um, price track. Okay, you know, delta, the orange delta, is the slope of the tangent to this red curved line. So delta itself is not stable. Delta itself will change. In other words, the slope of the tangent changes as we move up and down. And the rate of change of delta is not constant either. All right? Sometimes delta changes a lot when the underlying moves, and sometimes delta doesn't change very much when the underlying moves. So what we're going to have to introduce here is the rate of change of delta as the underlying asset moves. And the rate of change of delta as the underlying asset moves is referred to as gamma. So if you're told that this option has a gamma of 0.031, what you're, what you're being told here is for a dollar rise in the underlying S, the call's delta will be 0 .31, 0 0.031 higher. In other words, you'd expect the delta to expand to 0 0.501. And all we're really saying here is, you know, if the delta was 0.47 about here, all right, when the underlying moves up, the tangent increases, the slope of the tangent increases, um, and the delta expands to 0.5. Okay, so gamma's telling you how much your delta is changing for a unit move in the underlying. Gamma itself is only an approximation as well, but it does help us to understand a little bit better um, how our option behaves. It's a, it's a convex um, curve, isn't it, that we're moving along, not a straight line tangent like, uh, like delta suggests. So yes, gamma is the change in delta for a dollar change in the stock price. Um, let's try and visualize how gamma behaves. Uh, the, 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 the easy way to think about it is it's the curvature of the red line. It's how much the slope of the red line is changing when we shift the underlying asset around. That's what gamma is. Gamma is telling you how much the slope of the red line is changing when we shift the underlying around, when we move horizontally in these charts. So if you think about it, when we shift the underlying around, to see gamma, you have to ask the question, has the slope of the red line moved very much? If it has, you've got a high gamma. If it hasn't, you've got a low gamma. Or a very easy way to see it is to think, is the red line very curved? The red line is not very curved here. So this is going to be a low gamma area. When you shift the underlying around, when we're out the money for a call um, and for a put, the delta doesn't change very much. The delta's kind of stuck at zero. This red line is a relatively straight line. You shift the underlying around, the delta is pretty stable, so gamma is low. And similarly over here, when we're deeply in the money, if you shift the underlying around, delta is stable at one. It's stuck at one. It doesn't move around very much. So when we think of gamma, you know, you can see the red line is a pretty much straight line. The slope isn't changing very much when we shift the underlying around and move horizontally. Delta is stuck at, stuck at one. It's in the middle here, isn't it? Where we've got the most curvature, where delta changes most for a unit moving the underlying. In other words, moving horizontally. So gamma is maximized. If the yellow um, curve here is gamma, gamma is maximized when we are at the money, in the middle. That's where we've got most curvature. That's where our um, rate of change of the tangent, the curvature, is highest. You can always think of gamma, I like to think of gamma as how fast we're changing direction. You know you get g-force when you change direction, you know fighter pilots need to be trained in um, dealing with g-force when they change direction, all right? It's acceleration, changing, changing speed, changing direction rather than the direction itself. So I always think of g-force, gamma is g-force, the rate at which you're going around corners, the rate at which you're changing direction. Um, and um, if you think about it like that, you'd get the biggest g-force when you go around corners, and the biggest corners, biggest curvature is in the middle there. So you'll see the slides are agreeing with us here. We've got positive gamma. Well, um, I didn't explicitly allude to that, but let's just check that we can see that from our picture. Don't forget what gamma is. Gamma is the change in delta. It's change in delta relative to a change in the underlying. So now a change in the underlying in this particular Graphic um, is, let's make the ink color a little bit more user friendly. So it's change in delta relative to change 
in the underlying. That's what gamma is. So um, a change in the underlying, you can just kind of move to the right and think what happens to delta, because that's what, that's what it means to change the underlying. Underlying goes up, we move to the right. Well, as the underlying goes up and we move to the right here, you'll see delta goes up. So that's a positive relationship, isn't it? S goes up, move to the right, delta goes up from 0 to 1. That's a positive relationship. That's positive gamma. Um, you, now, you might make the mistake of thinking, well, the put must be the opposite. No, that's wrong. Check this out. As the underlying goes up, as S goes up, delta increases. It gets less negative. It goes from minus 1 up to 0. So it's still a positive relationship between delta and the underlying for a long put. Okay, so yes, long options have positive gamma. That means short options have negative gamma, but that's, you know, once again, you can use the general rule here that short positions are the negative of long positions. That generally does work. We've already said that gamma is greatest for at-the-money options. We've said that. That's why my yellow um, kind of bell curve there is peaked when we're at the money in the middle here. That's where curvature is greatest, the corners are sharpest. And by the way, as we approach expiry, you know, this red price track might have a month to go. If I let time pass and I move on to this green price track, there's less time to go, less time value, and it makes the cornering sharper, doesn't it? See that? That corner there was sharper. So as we approach expiry, we go around sharper corners, we get more g-force, you'll find higher gamma for options that are closer to expiry higher rates of change of delta when we're closer to expiry. In fact, that kink there, when we are at expiry, that kink in the blue hockey stick, um, that is like infinite gamma, isn't it? Because the delta goes from zero and then suddenly flicks to one. So rate of change there is like, you know, undefined. Then the undefined in terms of being infinitely big. Okay, so um, let's move away from gamma. Let's talk about theta. Theta's nice and easy to remember. T for theta, T for time. Uh, the impact of changing time on an option. Now, uh, we should be aware, we did mention briefly in the options refresher, that time is against option holders. If nothing else happens and time passes, the option um, time value will usually fall from being positive down to zero, and time decay hurts that time decay hurts the holder of options. So usually, theta is negative for long option positions because time runs out for option holders. Vega, um, V for Vega, V for volatility. Not technically a Greek letter, but you can see why they've done what they've done. Okay, um, Vega is your sensitivity in terms of the option premium relative to a 1% change in volatility that's being priced into the option, so implied volatility. Um, and we know that there's a direct relationship between volatility and option premiums. The more volatile the market expects the underlying asset to be, the higher the implied volatility of the option, and the higher the option premium will be. So positive vega for long calls, long puts. Ne now, yeah, um, just be careful with theta. You know, it's negative because time runs out. It's the, really, technically, theta is the impact of time passing, time falling, and uh, that's going to be negative. Gamma is nice and positive, as we've said, nice and easy to remember, positive for long option positions. All right, now, once we've got the basics of our Greeks lined up, we could always think about our overall Greek exposure for a combination of different positions. Okay? So, um, position deltas is a, is a simple idea. What we're going to do is combine different positions and sum up the deltas that we're exposed to to get an overall net exposure. Just be careful with signs here because as you know, calls have a positive delta and puts have a negative delta, okay? So just be careful with signs both in terms of um, the delta of the option that you're looking at plus your position. You know, longs get a positive sign, shorts will get a negative sign. If you're careful with those two ideas, then you're going to be just fine here. Um, the other thing that's Im implied by this example that comes along here, but isn't explicitly stated, is that these, in the States, certainly at least it's convention to have um, 100 shares underlying one option. So it's what's called a multiplier, 
Okay, so whilst Delta gives you an exposure with regards to um, how much the option behaves like the underlying, uh, there might very well be a multiplier, which for the US, um, in the exam, I'm sure they would tell you. They haven't got um, you know, uh, a track record of not telling you these things in the exam. They do tend to tell you these market conventions. All right? But in the book, they would tell you there's 100 shares per option. In the uh, example here, we're going to go with that as a default assumption. So look, if you've, got, if you've actually got 1,000 shares in a company, XYZ, and then you buy some puts, you buy 10 puts with 100 shares underlying each put, that's 1,000 shares underlying the puts in total, but your delta gives you the actual exposure that you're getting through the options. Your delta here is, um, well, it's, it's going to be negative because it's a put, which is a bearish position. That's no surprise. But um, in terms of your net exposure, here are your shares, 1,000 shares, and don't forget the underlying has a sensitivity to itself of one, trivially. It's, it moves in line with itself. But here are your options. 10 options, 10 puts, your long 10 puts. There's 100 shares per option. That's where the multiplier comes in. Okay, And there's your negative delta, which really reflects the fact that puts are a bearish position. So your overall net delta or position delta here is 400. What that means is you haven't fully offset the position. If you think of delta as exposure, the exposure that you're getting through the puts, which is only 60% of the underlying um, short, because it's negative, is not outlying the full 100% of the position that you've got in your long 1,000 shares um, uh, position. So it, it offsets some of the positive exposure in the stock, but not all of it. And if the share price falls by um, $1, you've still got this 400 share exposure. You'd expect to lose $400 because each of your, um, for every dollar loss, you've got exposure of 400 shares effectively. Okay. Um, so that's the practical application. This 400 here is really telling you how many shares you are exposed to. So a dollar loss on those shares means a four, translates into a $400 um, loss in your portfolio. All right, we're going to consider some of the strategies that we looked at in previous modules now with regards to deltas. So you'll remember um, a protective put. Protective put is long the underlying, okay, S plus P. And you'll remember in previous models we did make a big deal of um, the uh, simplified put call parity. You remember put call parity says C minus P is, well, it's a geared position in the underlying. It's a synthetic long, so you could view it as a forward position or a geared position in the underlying. All right, that's the most basic form of put call parity. When we kind of, well, that's, that's, uh, that's put call parity when you use the underlying stock price. Um, you could always use put call parity based on the forward contract as well, but we've already discussed that. Um, to simplify this, I say um, this is a basic version of it. You can simplify this a little bit more. If we ignore the gearing that we've used to fund the position, then you can say C minus P is a synthetic long. It's something that we have, um, you know, it synthesizes exposure to the underlying asset. It's something that we've said um, a lot over previous modules. And when you think about the protective put, and you think of it as S plus P, you can rearrange this equation and say it's going to give you essentially a long call-like exposure. At this stage, you know, that's the top left of the option diamond, you know, um, a protective put is like a long call. So we know what's going to happen here when we think about a protective put is that we're going to end up with a positive delta because a call has a positive delta, as you'll remember, and that's what we're synthesizing. In fact, this is really just leading on from the previous example that we did. That previous example was a protective put, wasn't it? Um, you know, the net exposure of the protective put is going to be like a long call, all right, because we are synthesizing a long call by having a protective put. We're retaining upside, like a long call has got upside, but it hedges below the strike, so it's got capped downside, like a long call has got capped downside. Um, Pre-expiry, if the stock rises significantly, the put falls to be out of the money, and we end up with a delta of plus one, which is what happens with a long call. Um, conversely, if the stock price falls significantly, the put goes deeply in the money and cancels out the, the long plus one delta that we're getting through our long stock position, which leaves us with a delta close to zero. Once again, that's what you'd expect if the underlying fell for a call. So no surprises here. We're really just saying 
we are synthesizing a call um, when we engage in a protective put. Similarly, um, a covered call, we know what this is already, we're along the underlying and we sell a call against it. Now this, if we go through, um, if we go through put call parity, the basic version of put call parity, C minus P is a synthetic long position, if we ignore the gearing that's involved in that synthetic long position, um, then we can rearrange for S minus C, take C off of both sides and we get minus P. Well look, what we're saying here is this covered call is synthesizing a short put position. Now you remember your option diamond looks like this and uh, we've said it enough over the modules I think that's such that we can just access it now and remember that our shorts are on the bottom and our puts are on the right. So there's your short put position that we're synthesizing here. Now with this short put position it might be worthwhile thinking about your sensitivities. This is a short put might be worthwhile just, um, just taking a bit of care here. You remember a long put, what did we say? We said that deltas were close to minus one here, deltas are close to zero here, and they're sort of minus a half here. That was a long put. And what did I say? When you, when you take a short position, you can just negate that. Delta's going to be close to one here, still going to be close to zero here, it's going to be close to a half here, because you're moving along this kind of price track. Okay, so this delta of a short put is uh, going to be between 0 and 1, positive, but it's going to get um, larger in absolute terms as the underlying falls and it's going to shrink as the underlying rises. That's what the um, exposure of a short put is. And we can see that coming through. Um, delta of 0 to plus 1. Um, it does give away upside. We know that about uh, the covered call. You get called away on upside above the strike of the call. Well, that's reflected in the short put by the fact that we've got limited upside. Okay, we, can't, we don't go up forever. Um, Pre-expire, if the stock price goes up significantly, the short call goes in the money, its delta expands and negates the delta of the long stock position, leaving us with zero delta. That's what's happening here. Your short call is expanding and cancelling out the delta of the long stock position. And if the underlying falls significantly, the call option moves out of the money and the position delta moves close to plus one. That's what's happening here. Okay, the call option is shrinking away, moving out of the money, the delta is shrinking to zero and you're left with a long stock position. Okay, let's think about a collar. How does a collar work when we're thinking about these exposures? Well, remember a collar is being long the underlying buying protection, like a protective put, and selling um, a call against that to generate income usually to help either part or fully fund that protective put that you've bought. So you might want to picture collars in your mind. Collars, they retained exposure, didn't they, between the two strikes, but below the put strike we had protection and above the call strike we gave away um, upside, so we didn't have any exposure there. And this is really the, the, the essence of a collar. It's reducing your exposure. So it should be no surprise here that we find that the collar uh, ends up with a delta that is significantly dampened. You know, a put has got a negative delta, so that's going to dampen the delta when you, when you bolt on that negative number. A call has got a positive delta, but minus call, in other words short call, that's going to have a negative impact. All right? The call has got a positive delta itself but you're selling it, so minus C is going to have a negative delta. So you're really suppressing the delta of the position. I think it's good enough for us to um, really come away with the fact that delta is going to be significantly, no we're not going to do any sums here, but delta is going to be significantly dampened by the existence of these options. Okay. Um, and uh, I think that's, that's probably good enough uh, when we're thinking about exposures. Um, obviously the idea is, is that when the stock price falls a lot, what you'll find is the put is deeply in the money and the minus one delta of the put will outweigh the plus one delta of the stock. Okay, so that, they'll cancel out and you'll have zero exposure. And then up here, it's the call, isn't it, that's it, the delta that's expanding to a big minus one.
cancelling out, you know, because you're short the call. It's expanding. The call itself is expanding, if you like, to plus one, if you thought about it as just a, a call option. But because you're short it, that position delta is expanding to minus one and negating your long stock um, delta. Okay, finally, we're going to con consider those spreads. We're going to have a think about a bull call spread prior to expiry. So a bull call spread, you might remember, very similar to the diagram we just drew. It's a moderately bullish position. And in terms of um, how you construct it, I'll just remind you, bull is long the low strike option. Whether it's calls or puts, you're going to go long the low strike option here. So this is moderately bullish. You're buying a low strike call and you're selling a high strike call. And the idea is the further up the underlying asset goes, the more the high strike options delta expands and cancels out the delta of the lower strike option. And that's what gives you moderate exposure. So yes, we give away upside above the short call strike. That's the higher one here. Um, but we are hedged. In other words, we don't have... Um, we don't have uh, full exposure. We are hedged below the long call strike price, the low strike that we bought under the bull spread. Uh, we are unhedged between the two strike prices. Prior to expiry, that won't be a perfect delta. That will be dampened by the fact that um, the, uh, the delta of the short call will be not as big as the delta of the, as the long call, all right, because it's a higher strike option, so it will be out of the money but uh, it will be offsetting the delta of the long call and leading us to have a delta that's positive, but uh, um, uh, closer to zero than just a long position. Okay, that concludes module nine. Uh, make sure you take away here uh, how these option positions behave prior to expiry from a delta perspective. Try and keep it descriptive and uh, try and picture what's going on. Don't get lost in the technical detail here because um, the danger is, is you fail to see the wood for the trees. So try and picture what's going on as we've been doing here.